guys? It's good to know I'm for real. <laughs> I, was, I was in a car accident a long time ago. I talk about it. The policeman was there. And he just saw me at the car accident. And the people in the car that, that I T-boned, because <laughs> they just pulled out right in front of me, looked one way, forgot the other traffic was coming. They whipped out, and yeah, it was, it, was, it was something. And I was like, Jesus, and boom, and it was pretty bad. But I ran over to that car so quick and uh, prayed for everybody. And their little granddaughter was in the back crying. They ended up sitting in there and holding her till the policeman came. And it was just a pretty, pretty amazing experience. Sometimes you can have a wrong view of Christianity. You can think God's just here to protect you and make sure that stuff doesn't happen. I actually believe that he's in me so that when things do happen, he can shine. Because if you don't understand that, now you just have another quandary and problem and insurance issues and inconvenience and where was God and why doesn't he protect me and I thought he loved me. And that doesn't sound real relational and encouraging. I think the way that seemeth right to man has taught us most of our lives, let me just be frank, our whole lives. <laughs> and unfortunately, after we're saved, we still allow that to be our wisdom. So sometimes we can get saved for the wrong reason. You read something amazing, 2 Corinthians 5, and I want to comment on it. What I was going to tell you about this police officer he saw me at the scene of the accident, and I finally had to go over and meet him and do the report, and he said, I said, look, everything seems to be fine. I prayed with everybody. They're good, and blah, blah, blah. We're just, I'm just being me, and he said, you sure have a real good attitude about all this, and I said, well, I don't know how else I would think, and he said, well, I could give you a few options, <laughs> because unfortunately, the way I was being, he's never experienced but I'm not the only person that ever went to church that he was at an accident with. Sorry. <laughs> the first accident I was ever in, the paramedic was mad at me when I said I was the driver of the truck because he thought I had to be kidding because I was so okay. Guys, you can't do that because you want to. It's supernatural. It's him. You have to want to. You have to be with him, and he empowers you to be different than we've ever been in our lives. That paramedic said, I've been to a thousand, over a thousand accidents. If you were the driver of that truck, I've never seen anything like it. And I smiled and said, I can explain. My point is, he's been to over a thousand accidents. Probably half of those people attend church. I'm not on the earth, so things go the way I hope. I'm on the earth to look like him in the moment. I'm not on the earth for anything to go the way I hope. I'm on the earth to shine because he said I'm a light and I'm to let my light so shine before men. He said if my eye is single, that means one voyage. If I'm on one voyage, then my whole body's flooded with light. He didn't say unless, of course, you were just in a bad accident. <laughs> he said if I see clear, I'll be clear. I just want to pass that on to y'all. Because this police officer was touched by my life. Now, you don't know what's going on around you most of the time. I don't wake up and try to minister. I wake up and enjoy Jesus. And you're ministering most of the time and don't even know it. Because people aren't used to sincere joy. They aren't used to real positive. They aren't used to life in someone, and most of the time you're ministering and you don't have a clue. Right. So I'm ministering to this man and have no idea. I just know that Jesus is Lord and we're okay and the truck was demolished and he's more than a truck. The truck was paid for, it was bought by people that got me the truck because they thought I would need it because I'm traveling so much years ago. So you could sit on the curb and say, God, I can't believe you got me this truck, and now you couldn't protect it, and now it's all smashed, and what am I going to do? Now I'm going to lose the value of the truck. Insurance is going to rip me off. God, I'm confused. What are you doing? 
Or you can just love on everybody around and let Jesus be Lord. And love not your own life unto death and make it never about you and all about him. Yeah. Seems to me I read tons of scripture that talk like that. <laughs> like, if you find your life, you lose it. If you lose it for his name's sake, you found it. Like, he talks like this in the Bible. He says, if you're going to come after me, you ought to deny yourself. Probably ought to pick up your cross so you can follow me, not just sing to me and pray to me when your list gets long. <laughs> I don't want him to get mad that you invited me. I'm trying to be gentle. But, <laughs> no, it's just, here's why. See, he said I was for real, and I want you to, this police officer, you don't even understand what, the situation was. So I go over to the lady to finally pray for her, the driver. She's like just staring out her shattered windshield looking at my truck. In Pennsylvania, you have a temporary tag. I don't know how you do it here in Michigan, but you get a 90-day temporary tag. They usually get it to you in about 30. Then you take that one out of your window and you have yours in the glove box and you're good. It's familiar? You do that here? Well, she saw it in the taped window, it taped in the window, so she knew it was brand new. She knew it was brand new because it was a temp tag. She's staring out the window going, I said, honey, I said, I'd love to pray with you and just want to make sure that you never have any residual effects, any whiplash effects, any pains, as if this accident never happened. I'm just going to pray and, and believe God with you. Okay, honey? She didn't say a word. She's just staring out my window. And I said, excuse me, ma'am, I just want to pray for you, okay? Usually I don't ask for that much permission. I just go for it, but I was being gracious and ask her for permission. I just held her granddaughter in the back and told her Jesus is Lord and sometimes things happen, but the fact that he's Lord makes everything okay and it's good to get your eyes on him, get to know him, put all your trust in him because he loves you, honey. She was 13. She was really scared. She was in a serious wreck and she was crying hard till I held her and just told her everything's going to be fine. She heard me pray for her grandpa. When I got to the back window, she crawled like a little kitten across the seat and let me get her. I'm a total stranger. She's 13. You'd think she'd have crawled to the other side. But she came to me. Grandma looks at me. She said, oh, no, it's a brand new truck. I hit a brand new truck. I said what you'd have said. I said, honey, it's a truck. You're what matters. And you're okay, I need to pray. She said, you don't understand. She got really mad. You don't understand. And I'm thinking, what am I missing here? She said, that is a brand new truck. I hit a brand new truck. Well, it's my truck. I'm well aware of that. I was in it when it spun and flew and landed. I had to fight out of my airbag. Everything was white when I landed. It was like the Wizard of Oz in the house. Boom, and I... It's all, I'm like, Jesus? I'm like, oh, it's airbag. <laughs> but she's like, I hit a brand new truck, and, and you don't understand. And she said, that driver is going to be so mad at me. <sighs> so guess what you do? You tip her little chin, and you say, honey. I am the driver. And she falls on your shoulder crying and says, oh, God bless you. Am I messing your thing up? How'd that thing, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> That's amazing. They actually made one to deal with me? That was cool. I just got up there and I saw you and I thought, uh-oh. I just blew up the hole. And it was looking right at me. As soon as I moved it, I was fascinated. I said, now watch this. The anointing removes the burden, destroys the yoke and removes the burden. I'm not anointed to put more weight on her. What is that? There you go. Oh, Lord. 
please, this has to work. We'll pull out farther or something. Can you fix it for me and get it out past my... It just feels back a little far. It's all right. Holy Spirit never leaves when you do this stuff. Okay, it just seemed like it was back on my chin a little, or my cheek a little. Okay, good. We don't want it. Well, don't bend it, buddy. Uh, that'll keep it up. There we are. I think we're good. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Now watch this. If I jump out of my truck and I look at my truck and all I'm worried about is my truck. I can't believe we had an accident. How couldn't she see the stop sign? Are you kidding? Why now? I'm trying to go true, trying to go preach the gospel. And now I got this smash trucks, brand new, three months old, paid for by people who wanted to empower me to have wheels to go the long haul because my other truck was 11 years old and tired. And you can just get all caught up and forget the only reason you're on the earth is to shine. It's why mercy woke you up today, to give you another day to be more like him. Like, mercy woke you up today, not so you don't have an accident, so you shine in the middle of life. (laughs) See, we somehow get the idea that he died on the cross just for us, so we can be forgiven, so we can go to heaven when we die. We like maybe haven't even considered he died to restore the truth of why he made man, put purpose back in us, put his life in us, put his spirit on us, and get back to his image, because that's why he made man. Let us make man so they can have a blast and do whatever they want. No, let us make man in our image. Like you can, the only reason you can find man's on the earth is because God made him with intention to be found in his image, that who God is is shining through him. So he made man one with him, and that got lost through sin. So Jesus was made to be sin to get that truth back in us. And if we're not careful, we've just made it all about us, getting something else, getting the blessing, getting the promotion, getting protection, getting provision. And if those things ain't coming, I ain't happy, and where is God? And none of that has anything to do with the motive of Christianity. You can't be a Christian for you. You're having a miserable time. If you're a Christian for you, you're not having fun. If you're a Christian for you, you are so caught up with you and circumstances, situations, money, people. He said, she said, how I feel and how this is going to work. And you're always looking over your shoulder and whatever it means to knock on wood. No, if you're a Christian for you, you're very self-focused. That's not cool. That's where worry lives. Anxiety lives, self-consciousness lives. And when I read my Bible, it said I deny myself. That means I ain't a Christian for me. I'm a Christian for his great name. I'm a Christian to bear witness to the image. And when the metal crashes, my life's not my own. I already died. So I can't even die in the accident. And it ain't about the accident. It's about shining. Whoa. Now, I know we don't get this because the policeman never met anybody like me. I'm not boasting in me. I'm boasting in a precept. I'm boasting in a motive. And the paramedic never met anybody like me. And hundreds out of the thousands had to go to church. Just had to. So I guess we don't attend church. I guess we are the church. And I guess we're called to let our light so shine before men so they see our lives and give glory to God. Why is this significant? That lady fell on me and cried and said, God bless you. There was a 19-year-old fire worker who left me use his phone because I didn't have a phone back in those days because I didn't have one until not long ago. (laughs) I know, it's hard to imagine. I still don't even own a computer. I don't think it's the one-eyed beast. I don't think it's the Antichrist. I'm just not interested. I'd rather take a walk in the woods, cast my fishing rod, or pray for the sick. I just don't know what I'd do with a computer. I have no idea what I'd do with it. So I don't have one to this day. Not against them, just don't have any desire. 
and I seem to be doing okay. And if you think I'm out of my mind, I might just be out of yours. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> this police officer is observing me. The fire worker gives me his phone. I call my wife. I'm looking at the, the pretty side of my truck. And I'm talking and I'm chuckling. And she said, your truck, your, hit, your truck. I said, it's okay. I said, can you get your sister? Is she still over at your mom's? Yeah. Could you see if she'll swing by and pick me up and take me over to my pickup spot? We were all going to carpool and go preach the gospel 40 minutes, 45 minutes away. Because I don't have a phone, I can't tell all my friends what's going on. They're wondering where I'm at, and I'm the preacher, so they're going to wait for me. <laughs> she said, yeah, I'll do that. And this young man's watching me, and I'm telling him how they're okay, and I prayed for them all. Grandma, when she yelled at me, remember Grandma yelled at me, you don't understand, I had a brand new car, remember? You know what happened to her little granddaughter in the back when Grandma snapped? <laughs> she got shook, and she starts crying again. I said, this is your granddaughter, right? She said, yes. I said, can I get in the car and just comfort her and hold her? She said, yes. The little girl heard me. When I opened the door, she's already right there wanting to crawl on my lap. I'm a stranger. But she perceives love and peace and everything she's looking for. It's in Jesus. So I just held her and rocked her like she's my own granddaughter. I just ministered the word to her and praying over her, kissed her on her little forehead, and she was just so okay. And that's when the policeman came, and I said, Honey, I have to go see the police officer. You're going to be fine, sweetie. Jesus loves you so much. It was so fun. Three months later, I'm down in the southern end of the, the county, and I'm doing a healing service. A Methodist church said, We believe God heals. We just don't know anything about it. And we don't know what to do if it doesn't happen. And we can't answer all the questions people have. But we heard some just good things about you, your life, your message. Would you come and help us? And I'm on the phone acting real calm. Sure, yeah. When, what did you have in mind? Well, could you just do some healing services like on Sunday nights for a while? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I hung up the phone. I'm like, yeah. I was like freaking out. I was so excited. <laughs> so I was down there and I'm preaching and this man stands up back in the back, second to the last pew from the back. He's just standing while I'm preaching. I'm thinking he has back trouble. It's a healing service. He can't sit long and I talk a while. And I just thought we need to pray for him probably. I said, sir, do you have something going on in your back? Why are you standing? Or do you? He said, actually, I, I wanted to ask you something. I said, oh, okay. He said, were you in an accident back in April? It was three months before and such and such. I said, yes, actually, yes, sir, I was. He said, I didn't expect you to recognize me. I was the officer. And then I went, dude, I see it now. Hey, and we're talking and laughing. And he just lifts his voice. Watch what he says. Gives me a live infomercial. Like he says, I just want to let you people know, because at a healing service, I'm not even, wasn't even talking about healing. I was talking about living Christ. I was talking a lot about what I always talk about at the healing service, because to me, that's healing. Yeah. Woo! Like, I have never been so healed as the last 28 years. <laughs> like, I'm so free from me, I finally got free. So now I'm free from me, I'm free from you. I got the best look at you I've ever had. Instead of needing you, I could love you. See, I didn't wake up for you to love me today, so I got it made. I'm already in, already won. I'm so loved by God, so I can be loved. Yay. I'm going to let my light so shine before men. You treat me wrong, I love you. It just means you don't see what I see. So Jesus said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. That sounds simple. <laughs> this is where we're at. It's where we'll be at all weekend until I get on the plane, and I'm going to stay there, and I'm hoping you'll go with me. Not, not on the airplane. In the revelation. <laughs> I mean, if you want to fly to Pennsylvania, you can, but. See, I'm just a messenger. I'm just crying out my heart. I know this young man and love his heart and his family. And when he asked me to come, I said, yeah, I didn't even hesitate. I said, yeah, quick, didn't I? Yeah, because I wanted to be here. I could be in big settings tonight. I really could. I'm here because I want to be. I buy my plane tickets. We didn't talk about no honorarium. Most of the time, I don't even take one because I'm not here for money. I'm here for truth. I'm having the time of my life. 
like a car is demolishing my truck and all I know how to do is love the people. I don't know about you, but that sounds like freedom. And then this policeman, he tells the people, I just want you to know this guy is so for real. And I'm like, man, it's a little tough. No offense, Ethan. It's a little tough when the the best testimony you have and the compliment people give you is, you know what I like about you? You're for real. I'm like, okay, so what are you? <laughs> like, why is it a testimony? Because I'm for real as a Christian. Why is that an enigma? Why is that what you like so much about me? Because I'm legit. So you're not? You're half in, half out? You're... It just shouldn't be a testimony. But it's the one I got in my whole life. I've heard it a million times over. You know what I like about you? You're real. I'm like, okay. So what are you? And when people are saying that, that means they're skeptical. That means they're looking. That means they're... He didn't do that tonight. He's just saying he's been around me. He knows me and what I preach is who I am. That's all he said. Watch what this police officer said. Same thing. He said, this man is for real. Everything you hear him preaching, I saw him live right where the rubber meets the road. Because I was at the scene of a very serious accident where it looked like there should have been injuries. And this man is running around loving everybody, praying for everybody, as nice as anybody I've seen. And he said, I've never experienced an accident. And he just goes on and tells his testimony about my life at the scene of an accident. Now watch what he said. You don't even know this stuff, see? It's my one shot at this man. I might never have another shot at this man. That was my one shot. It's called my sphere of influence, the people that I pass by. He said, what you don't know about me, this is my first time ever stepping through the doorway of a church. He said, I'm 40 years old and I was violated and touched wrong at the age of eight by a man that said he was a Christian. So at age eight, I said it in my heart, if that's what Christian is, I want nothing to do with it. I'll never be around it or give myself to anything that's called Christian. So I'm 40 years old, and I've never been inside of a Christian church in my life. He said, I was just diagnosed with a sickness. My friend saw the sign. He said, a healing service. He said, I've never, I've, I've, I've met this man, and I've never thought about believing in God, going to church, but I couldn't get this man out of my mind. I talked about him to several people, and I'm thinking about this man, and I said, wonder if this guy is the real Christian. Wonder if the guy that did that to me when I was eight isn't a Christian at all. Wonder if I met Christian. I might have been rash. I might have made a vow to something I don't even... I think I met the real Christian. And he said, when my friend said, hey, I saw a sign on a church. I know you don't do churches, but it said healing service. You got this diagnosis. Look, it doesn't hurt to go. We we'll sit in the back. If it's weird, we'll leave. But let's just try it out and go. You got nothing to lose. He said, as soon as he asked, he said, if I wouldn't have met that man at the accident, I'd have laughed him out of my car for suggesting it. But because I can't get this experience out of my head, he mentioned it and I said, okay, I'll go. And I didn't even hesitate. And then I walked through the door and it's the very man standing in the front. Now you can't make that up. And that's my one chance. And if I'm kicking the grass, complaining, and then trying to tell her it's okay when I showed her it's not, I am not on the earth for me. I'm on the earth for his great name. He paid the price of his son and gave his life on a cross, not so I can live mine in my own will, way, and wisdom, so that I can get back to why I'm here in the first place, and we can be in covenant, and we can be one, and Christ in me can be the hope of glory. Changes my attitude, changes my motive, changes my mind, and narrows down my eye to single. And all of a sudden, I'm not yell, but, and wide view lens, and, well, you know, well, I feel, well, what about, well, how come they had to, well, I wouldn't if they, and all of a sudden, you got an eye like this. No, my eye is extremely fine-tuned. I got one option, not two. It's Christ. And I'm going to love you, I'm going to forgive you, and I'm going to manifest him the best I understand him, Period. You get it? So for 28 years, 
I've been free. Because <laughs> you're not free if you're living for you. You're in bondage to you because you were never made for you. You were made for his image. So the biggest lie on the planet is every day people wake up and live for themselves. They even use God for their own gain. He's not your busboy. He's not your genie in a bottle. He's not your table waiter. He's your father. And he made you with purpose. And he made you with destiny. And he told Adam, the day you eat that tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the day you surely die. Well, we all know he didn't fall over dead, so something had to die. What died? The image. And Adam got separated from God, the source of life and the source of love. And he died inside, and he became in need of love instead of being love. And every person since that day was born into Adam, and everybody in this room knows what I'm talking about. When you were born, you had no idea who you were. You didn't have a value. You didn't have an identity. You didn't have nothing. You needed valued, loved, supported. You need somebody significant in your life to prove you even mattered. Everybody in this room, from little up, as long as you can remember, you didn't have a clue who you were. You were, at a young age, nothing more than how you responded to how it unfolded. And that's what you called you. And you called that your identity. That's why people talk about their story all the time. That's why people are 50 still talking about how it was growing up. Because it's the only place they ever found any sense of identity, whether good or bad. A Christian's supposed to put off the old. Put on the new. Come out of darkness into the light. Put off the old man and his deeds. Put on the new. Paul said, the one thing I do to apprehend and lay a hold of that which he laid a hold of me for, which means Jesus has intention in purchasing you. He said, the one thing I do to reach that thing that he grabbed me for is I forget what lies behind. Why? Because there's nothing there. Yeah? So Jesus bought us with intention. That's why, so, so watch this. Hurt, frustration, anxiety, fear, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness. None of it lives where there's selflessness. None of that lives unless there's self-centeredness. And we've been trained by it and we think it's normal. But living for yourself is perverted when you're created for his image. Watch. Love doesn't seek its own. Now we all say, love you, I love you. We even get in our romantic settings, I love you. And we say, do you love me? <laughs> yeah, well, you didn't sound like you meant it. Do you really love me? You didn't sound like, you didn't act like every time I say I love you, I mean it with all my heart, and then you say you love me, you don't even act like you care. <laughs> the more people do this craziness. I don't know three words that cause more hell and pain on the earth than I love you. There's no three words that ever cause more heartbreak and more pain than the words I love you. Why? Because we say it in a self-centered way. And actually what we're saying is I need you. Don't jump ship. Don't break my heart. Don't shatter me. Don't wreck my world. Because I finally have a missing link. I have something that gives me some stability. Please don't shake that. I love you. No, what you're saying is I need you. Because watch this. I can prove it. Because love takes no account or keeps no record of wrong. Then why do we have so many fallouts? Why are we so bitter and we know the story and the facts like it happened yesterday? And it's become our language. Why? Because we have so much need. And I love you never was really I love you. Because love never fails. Then why has it failed? Then why don't we even talk to the people that were the most significant in our life? How can you have three children and now you don't even talk? How can you come together, have three children, now you don't even talk? It's because we never understood love in the first place. Because even if one of the people jumped ship, went off the deep end, why doesn't the other person know how to forgive them, Father? They don't know what they do. And if they really knew who they were, they wouldn't be living this way and hurt for them instead of hurt because of them. Cry for them instead of cry, cry because of them, cry for them. Because we were trained by self-centeredness because we were all born into Adam. And what's Adam? No identity. Bankrupt. Doesn't know how to love, just needs love. And everybody in this room needed love, needed attention, and needed affection from the time you can remember. And we've been looking for love everywhere. And people get hard, and they get jaded, and they get hurt, but they're still in survival, and they're still trying. And then this truth comes along, and love comes. And all of a sudden, for God so loved 
You read it, not imputing their trespasses. Reconciling men back to God. Not seeing them for where they've been. Seeing them for what he created them for. See, now I get it. I never understood it when I was little. Everybody says, well, God just forgives. What do you mean he just forgives? And then you tell me I'm going to go keep messing up. And he's going to keep forgiving because that's what the blood does. That's what you tell us when we're little going to church. Nobody's perfect. We're still messed up. We still sin all the time, but he loves us. Well, he, he told me to reckon myself dead indeed to sin, to love not my own life unto death, to put on righteousness and put on Christ. That's not the same message I grew up with. Yeah. <laughs> So how can I reckon myself dead indeed to sin and boast in my ability to commit it on a daily basis? See, it's where the room freaks out. I can feel it in the room. What are you saying? Are you perfect? Oh my God, Ethan invited a heretic. <laughs> See, we are brainwashed into sin instead of righteousness. My Bible says if I put on righteousness, it'll produce its fruit to holiness. What about that scripture? The Bible says if I live by the Spirit, I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. What about that scripture? It says don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Don't present yourself as members of unrighteousness, but members of righteousness to obedience. What about all those scriptures? I read the book. I found them. Nobody was teaching them to me. They were just teaching our own failed, miserable human experience. And they were saying, you're a mess up. You're always going to be a mess up. And you ought to be glad he considers you and forgives you. And you better be in church when he comes back. <laughs> and I used to always think, wonder if he comes back and we're not having service. <laughs> oh, I'm just telling you, nobody preached the gospel to me growing up. They just told me he died on the cross because I was a sinner and the blood forgives my sin, makes a way for me to go to heaven when I die. Try to do a little better than you used to do because he does love you. And I never understood love in that. I was like, why does he care about me? Why does he love me? If I'm such a mess, if I'm failure waiting to happen, and why does he even want me in heaven? He doesn't even seem real. He ain't close. Where even are you? And now you paid a price that extreme is putting your son on the cross to die for me so I can be in heaven with you forever, and I don't even know you now? See? It sounded strange to me growing up, so I had no ambition, ambition or desire to live the Christian life because I didn't understand it. And now I'm so consumed. <laughs> Yay. Because <laughs> I get it. The whole time I'm living what I'm living, Jesus' words are before the Father. Forgive him. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's blind. He's deceived. He has no clue who he is. It's identity crisis. He doesn't even know who he is. He thinks he's on the earth for him. He thinks people should serve him. He's living in his own little fantasy kingdom world. He's trying to make his wife and his children his subjects and servants. He's... If you do one thing that he doesn't like, he'll let you know it. And his disposition will change and his selfishness will shine. Yeah? But forgive him, he doesn't know what he's doing. So mercy keeps coming and God keeps convicting. And Holy Spirit keeps moving. His love never fails. And one day he gets the attention of my heart and I shift and I go. <gasps> God reveals himself. And I let everything go and realize I was made for one reason, for him to live inside of me and love through me. And that the whole reason God sent Jesus to die on the cross wasn't just to forgive my sin, but to restore the truth of why I'm here. So did he die because I'm a sinner? He had to die because I sinned. But he didn't die because I'm a sinner. He died because I was a lost son and purpose was lost. He died because the reason I'm on the earth was hidden. I didn't know I could shine. I didn't even know I could love like God loves. And I couldn't except he put his same spirit in me that raised him from the dead. That should change things. That's not theology. That's truth. So he put a new heart in me. He put a new spirit in me. And I'm a new creation. You read it tonight. 
I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Woo! So if I'm a new creation, I must have a new motive. I must have a new purpose. I must have a new reason for being. The why in my life has to change, I guess. Now I'm alive for another reason. Not the one I used to be alive for. It used to be all about me and how I feel and the tit for tat. And he said, she said, well, I wouldn't be if they didn't. Well, how come? Well, they should never. See, then everything has power over you. And everything you are is being dictated by everything around you instead of the one inside of you. You're not to be pottered by life. You're to be pottered by the giver of life. You shouldn't be on that wheel. That's the wrong wheel. Well, you don't know what I'm going through. No, no, no. What about what he went through? When does that become greater than my circumstances? Because what he went through gives me answers and changes my response. Now I can actually walk in love. I can show mercy. I can make peace. In fact, I don't even have a grid for unforgiveness. I'm not even trying to forgive. Church, let me just help you with something. If you're trying to forgive, you're in unforgiveness. Why is it such an option? Because you have rights and people crossed your line. Well, you cross God's line every day of your life. But because he's love, he doesn't bring it up. He washes it away. See, if God treated us like we treated each other, we don't have hope, Ethan. So he wants us to follow him. Not just receive from him and sing to him and pray to him our troubles. Follow him. There's something I want you to understand about Jesus tonight. Because I don't have much time with you guys. I got a little bit tonight, a little bit tomorrow, and I'll be back on a plane. Some of you hopefully aren't going to say, good riddance. No, I, I, listen, I flew here because I believe what I'm telling you. Like, I'm having the time of my life for 28 years. Not days, not months, years. Just freedom. Not self-conscious, loving people, praying for people as much as you can, sitting on planes, praying, just praying. I mean, you go through TSA, and they're like, how you doing? You're saying, I'm doing amazing. They're like, really? (laughs) Nobody says that. (laughs) Well, then they mustn't have Jesus on the inside, or they don't know it. Look at me, friend. He's in me. And they're like, whoa. (laughs) 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 No, no. That's how you can live. I just had to run in and get a little permit for some over at my parents' house, and, and I ran into City Hall, and there's a lady there with braces on, and I said, oh my goodness, what'd you do, ma'am? Is that carpal tunnel? Oh, well, no, actually, it's a serious nerve disorder, and she got a little teary. I said, oh my goodness, sweetheart, listen, whatever it is, please let me pray for you. Don't say no. Jesus loves you so much. She's staring in my eyes. I could feel him come in my face. Oh, I could feel him. He was right there looking at her. No, I could feel him. He just filled my face. He was in my eyes. I could feel him. And she couldn't stop looking right in my eyes. I said, honey, he loves you so much. He changes everything. He's so good. I said, give me your hand. She's staring. Father, I think she's... She's crying. That's, That's automatic. Why? I don't have issues. Not self conscious. I ain't trying to get over something. I ain't wondering where God's been. Do you think everybody's treating me right? Do you think my family's making great choices nonstop? Or do you think I have the same challenge as you have? Peter said, don't think it's strange when you go through things. Your brothers all over the earth are going through the same stuff. So don't single it out and make your story worse. Because somebody's is worse, but the answer's the same. Look, if I start here and we just go through, some are usually younger, older, some of us have more story than others, but we just go through the hell we've all been through. And we just tell our story. Well, I can tell you mine. What's it accomplished telling you the hell I've been through? Because if I tell you my story, there ain't nothing about my story you see in me. Does it look like I've been through hell or does it look like I'm just a crazy man or brainwashed? No, my brain has been washed. 
Doesn't mean I wasn't touched inappropriately at a young age. Doesn't mean my dad wasn't an alcoholic and I never heard him in my life say I love you. Doesn't mean my mom wasn't sick 40 years and I changed her diapers, carried her to bed, and we put her in a grave early. Doesn't mean that my kids didn't run wild at a certain age when I was pastoring. My wife went in identity crisis, had a severe seizure for an hour, and had severe brain damage in a coma. See, when I start ripping off my story, you don't see it. Why? Because none of those things have anything to do with who I am. They're all opportunities to manifest Jesus. They're all opportunities to shine. And I've learned the darker it gets around you, the brighter that light is on the inside of you. Because the last time I read scripture, light is greater than darkness. Then why are we so shook up by the darkness? Because if you look up the definition of darkness, it means the absence of light. So let your light so shine. I could show Isaiah he was on to something. Arise, shine, church. Your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is upon you. Watch this. Darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the light is on you. Yeah? It's time to walk in the light. Now you hear somebody preaching like this and you're going through a hard time and you've been taking your sufferings in account of your suffered wrongs. That's because you've been walking outside of love. Love takes no account of the wrong done to it. So when you get tricked into feeling sorry for yourself, the list grows. And that becomes your justification for however it is you seem. But the last thing I need is a story to validate my life to not look like him. I don't need a reason to not look like him. I have a reason to look like him and to just live by faith. And it takes surrender. But if I wake up and get tricked, see, I'm not talking to a room of evil people. You're not hypocrites. I'm not talking to a room of hypocrites. I didn't fly here to correct you. You're not here on a Saturday night because you're trying to find a way to miss God. I'm talking to his kids, but we're destroyed for the lack of knowledge. So in all our getting, get understanding. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. See, we grew up, well, what you don't know won't hurt you. Did you ever hear it? Anti-Bible. The Bible says what you don't know is destroying you. Isn't it amazing? There was a language from little up telling you what you don't know won't hurt you. Sticks and stones break your bones, but words can never hurt you. And then people say, sticks and stones break my bones, but words can never hurt me. And the whole time you're dying inside because you're taking the words personal, and words have much power. Well, what you see is what you get. You don't ever live by what you see. It's subject to change. The things unseen are eternal. Well, if I were you, it'd be great if it worked out, but I wouldn't get my... Oh, my goodness. You heard that all the way up here in Michigan? I wouldn't get my hopes up? When faith is the substance of things, that hope is the anchor to my soul passing through the veil into his presence? That hope's been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit and won't disappoint? Well, if I were you, Ethan, I wouldn't get my hopes up. Why do we say that? It's a self-centered motive to protect people from getting hurt. I don't want you to be let down, devastated, heartbroken. Hate to see you put all your trust in this only to be shattered. It's a self-preservation phrase. But if you're already dead and alive unto him, it doesn't apply. (laughs) Yay. You see, there's nothing I've preached in this house so far that you can't live. There's nothing I've preached that you can't wrap faith around it apart from any situation in your life. I just ran my little tiny list. There's people with a worse list than mine. We could go the whole way through the room and all we'll find is who's been through the most hell. And then about the worst you can do is feel, or best you can do is feel sorry for them, but you can't help them because you ain't been in their shoes and they won't let you because you don't know what I've been through. Now we got a paradox. And all of a sudden, I guess our life and our story defines us. Nope, his life and story is the truth about me. And the truth is so powerful that it'll make you free. And if you continue in it, you'll know it. And he who the sun sets free, free indeed. See, that's what's wrong with me. No, the truth came and rescued me out of darkness. 
the light of the world came and shone in my heart through the Holy Ghost. And I've been free from me for 28 years. So I've been free from you for that long. <laughs> and I'm finally empowered to love you and see you for who you really are, whether you understand or not. So if you're mistreating me, if you're doing something out of order, I would go in my bedroom and cry for you. Not cry because of you. God, why do you let them do that? If I'm a son, you're supposed to protect me and get my rear guard. Knock them off their big old fat pride high horse. Praying all David's psalms. Cut off their arms. Slice their throat. Take off their heads. <laughs> filthy Philistines. <laughs> nope. God, if they had any idea who they were, they wouldn't be living what they're living. God, if they knew you, if they were filled with your spirit and they were walking in your love, they wouldn't have said what they said. God forbid I sell so cheap when I'm not for sale that I would yield to that thing. Would you have mercy on them, God? Would you show them truth? Would you minister in the night, Holy Spirit? Give them a dream. Manifest your goodness. That sure beats being ticked off at people. See, here's how you know. Like when you're done wrong, in life and betrayed, if you live betrayed, you don't understand the gospel. You're letting life define you, not the giver of it. And your potter is life, not him. Come on. You said we can mourn. We don't grieve as those who have no hope. Doesn't mean we don't grieve. My brother just fell over, massive cardiac arrest, heart just stopped in his tracks, deer season, shot a nice buck, I take a picture, he leaves all happy, we butcher it in my suburb backyard for all my neighbors to see. <laughs> Another deer gave his life for the gospel. <sighs> my brother leaves the yard with two buckets of meat to go get some sausage and bologna, as sighted as can be, and never left the butcher shop. He's my best friend. He wasn't just my brother, he's my best friend. Just fell dead in his tracks. You can't tell that. I miss him terribly. But you can't tell that. Why? Because I don't grieve as if I have no hope. He didn't say I don't grieve. You just don't live hopeless. Why? Because Jesus shed his blood and my brother is amazing forever. And the worst I can do is miss him physically for a season sentimentally for a season compared to eternal glory with him this is a brief moment of light affliction but I've watched Christian after Christian lose a significant loved one and never recover stop praying mad at God and every time the anniversary rolls around they get harder bitter hurt and lonely I've watched it church attending people that won't let their minds get renewed by the gospel so they live out of the pain of their heart. Come on, I'm on you a little bit on that one. He didn't say we don't grieve. He just said we don't grieve as if we have no hope. If my brother could come back for five minutes and take this mic, you think I'm passionate? He would make me look backslidden. If you could bring my brother from, for five minutes from the presence of eternity in the Lord, just to encourage us for five minutes, we probably wouldn't be able to handle it. Knock us off our seats. Because he's living in the end result. And we all caught up with feelings and emotions. And... <laughs> but I miss him. I do. I miss him bad. But he's with Jesus forever because of the blood. And it inspires me to run all the more because I'm a man of faith. And never grow weary in well-doing and store my treasures in heaven. Why? Because I'm a pilgrim and a sojourner and I'm just passing through. <laughs> so if you're a Christian for your sake, you are not having the time of your life. <laughs> oh, I promise you're not. You're very self-conscious and you have more questions than you have answers. And you're not excited. Good tidings, the angel said when Jesus was born, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Now, I'm not being critical here, but I'm just saying, where's the great joy in the body of Christ? I mean, circumstances dictate our disposition. A person's comments and words, just a spouse not saying the right thing is enough to shatter somebody's emotional makeup. 
Come on. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. <laughs> so it, it makes sense to me that we don't understand the message. The good tidings is what we're missing. And we've turned it into a prayer that takes me to heaven instead of heaven coming back inside of me and me coming out of darkness into the light and walking in the light as he's in the light. All of a sudden, I get to live Christ, not sing to him. All of a sudden, I get to live Christ, not just need him on my list. Because it's dangerous because if something don't happen on that list, that affects you. Oh, I promise. I've pastored for long enough to know people will throw in the towel on God because of their circumstances. And he said, you should glory in your tribulation. He said, you should count it all joy when you're faced with various trials. What? Yep, yeah, that's what he said. Why? Because it brings perseverance and character, develops you and you mature, complete, and lacking in nothing. And all of a sudden, the devil doesn't even know how to touch you. Because every time he touches you, he manifests Jesus. See, he's convinced he can break you. But he runs a risk he'll make you if you're a believer. <laughs> no. Son, I'm not picking a fight, but go ahead and squeeze me. Son, when you squeeze an orange, what do you get? Yeah, what kind of juice? So it wouldn't be apple. It'd be pretty weird. So if you squeeze the big old sun-kissed orange on that little ripply thing that puts the pulp in there and bloop, 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 and you put it to your mouth and it was apple juice, you'd spit it right back in the cup because you knew it was an orange. You'd call her and say, I just squeezed an orange and it was apple juice. And she'd say, dude, what were you drinking? Be weird. Would it be weird to squeeze an orange and get apple juice? Well, then why isn't it weird when you squeeze a Christian and get everything but Christ? That should be weird. How come it's so okay to squeeze a Christian and get everything but Christ? So the devil says, hey, this is easy, pushover, okay, made a big mistake when I crucified the Son of God. Because if the kings and rulers of the earth knew what they were doing, they'd have never crucified him, but they did. Made a big mistake when I crucified the Son of God, opened the door for salvation, transformation, infilling of God's Spirit, people empowered to live in covenant with God and use the authority and power of His name and have dominion on the earth and move mountains. I made a big mistake when I did it, but I'll tell you what, it's not so bad, because I know people, I've known them from the beginning, ha ha, Eve was a pushover, Adam followed her instead of God, people are people, I can't stop God, I'll stop them, let them go to church, all night prayer, wave as many flags as they want, let them do as much as they want towards the Lord, I'll just make sure they never become love, never walk in love, make sure deep in their heart they're still thinking about themselves, they're hurt, they're in unresolved conflicts, get them to jump to a few churches till they get so hurt that they're just marred in their hearts towards the body of Christ, and they've been in all the right places, seeing all the wrong things, and they just give up, yep, can't stop God, can sure stop them. Let them pray all night. Just make sure they don't love. Make sure they don't walk in the light. Make sure they take account of the suffered wrongs. Make sure. Yeah. That's what he does. He could care less if we're in church. He cares when we are the church. He cares when we walk alone, when we show mercy and we make peace. He cares when you have a right and you don't take it because you denied yourself. He cares when you cover a multitude of sin with love, when you let mercy triumph over judgment instead of repeating the story to four others. I tell you, he can't stop the love of God and he can't stop the mercy of God. That's why we're sitting here with the spirit of God in us because he can't stop mercy. But if he stops us from being merciful, he's winning. If he stops us from becoming love, then he's winning. And you can fill every church tomorrow as a traditional church day. You can fill every seat in every church tomorrow. doesn't mean anything will change. But if people become love, something's got to change. If people become love, something's got to change. No for offense. Do you know how many people I've sat on planes beside over the years I've traveled that don't go to church anymore and have the same story? Church, church, something happened, don't go to church anymore. And I found that when they have that in their resume, they don't have communion or fellowship with God either. 
Ain't that something? Guard your heart. Out of your heart flows the issues of life. Satan wants you in all the wrong places, living from all the wrong places. Be this close, just this close to Jesus and not obtain him. I said a lot. I know you got something out of this. See, just provoking a want to in you. The only thing that can keep you from living this is not wanting to. But if you say yes, grace will start empowering you if you begin to pray. And God, I want to live what you paid for. I read in that Bible up there. I could open it and make the meeting legal to some. <laughs> some people are just so religious. They're like, he talked all that time and never read out of his Bible. Just don't get like that. That's yucky. It's yucky. Where, where do you show me a scripture that if I didn't read out of the Bible, God wasn't in the meeting? Jesus spoke out of the Spirit of God. He wasn't just speaking truth. Jesus was the truth. And then were so critical that they killed him for what he said. How do you kill the truth? Being sure he's wrong. Oh, that's scary. It's because they never wanted to hear what he was saying. They heard what they didn't agree with. That's all they listened for, what they didn't agree with, so they could never hear what he said, so they killed the truth. That shows you how far man can fall when he's not in God. That he's so wrong, and he's sure he's so right. And he's so wrong. Well, you know them by there. So what's your life producing? That's not judgment. That's not condemnation. It's a barometer. Here's what the Lord asked me a long, long time ago. Probably 26 years ago, 25 years ago, I was laying on my bed. He said, Dan... If everybody on the earth that said they were a Christian was living what you're living, would it matter? And would it make a difference? And would anybody know me? If I turned everybody that said they were a Christian into what you're living, and this was the standard of Christianity, would it matter? And would people know me because of that? And that's an amazing question. That's what he asked me. He said, if everybody was living, Dan, what you're living, calling it Christian, would it change things? And I thought, that challenges me to grow more. But at the same time, I thought, yeah. Because I knew what I was living. Are you with me? But if you're living defended, protected, you got walls up because you've been hurt and you won't let people in that space anymore. That's called living hurt every day. You had this thing. I didn't look around. I don't know who raised their hand for broken. That's just you being humble, saying I'm in this place and I need some prayer. But watch this. If you don't get understanding on why you were broken, you'll have your hand up again sometime down the road. He heals the brokenhearted. Now watch. It's your motive in life, in Christ, that allows you to be broken or not broken. Because people will continue to do things that could break you if you didn't see different. Are you all with me? (laughs) Not being arrogant, not being self-righteous, watch. What I'm preaching right now, you can't break. (laughs) Are you following me? I learned this a long time ago. You can only emotionally abuse someone who doesn't know who they are. And emotional abuse is a hot topic in the earth. And it's real and it's legitimate, but it's falling on crushed identities. You can only emotionally abuse somebody who doesn't know who they are. How are you going to emotionally abuse this? You'll get emotionally abused trying. Because I didn't wake up needy. Bear with me. I didn't wake up needy this morning. Mercy woke me up, gave me another day to be more like him. That's why I'm alive. I didn't wake up to get anything from you so you can't let me down. That's already settled before I even got out of bed. I woke up to love. I woke up to shine. We're going to do well whether you like me or not. Like it takes two to tango. It takes one to pursue peace. You could curse me, stand up, scream at me, and walk out the door. You can't take a thing from me that I'm sharing. 
Now, you'll do something when you do that. You'll trigger my heart for you and compassion. And tonight, when I'm all alone and think about that, I'll cry when nobody's looking. And I'll know that you're just hurting, lost, and you got inner struggles, and you don't understand, so you're venting and you're fuming. I'm not going to belittle you and say, what a jerk, and I can't believe they interrupted the meeting. Nope, when nobody's looking, I will be weeping for you because I know you don't know. And you know what Holy Spirit will do? He'll come in the middle of the night. Because he hears those prayers. Because they're fueled by love. They're not fueled by pain. Anger, frustration, judgment, or self-righteousness. They're fueled by love. And he hears love because he hears himself. Are you with me? It'd be amazing, Lydia, if we could just pray for people because we're breaking for them and not broken because of them. And we can actually hurt for them because we know if they knew what we see, they wouldn't be the way they are. Yeah. Why is that offensive to us? Why doesn't that provoke mercy? Why do spouses just give each other the silent treatment and emotional games and try to express how they feel without words to send a message to get a response? It's very common in marriages. It just says you both need to know Jesus more. And somehow it got all about you. Or maybe it always was. But it's time to get back on track. Are you all with me? Because Jesus wouldn't do that. Are you all all right? You good? You ought to be good. I don't know what this thing's doing, but it's sitting up off my ear. We really flexed it or something, buddy. (laughs) The whole time it's on the outside of my ear, pinning my ear tight to my head. Like the ref should have just called the match. Pinned. It's been pinned for 40 minutes, 45, and I'm like, my ear is pinned. I could feel it the whole time. I was like, I need to rescue my ear. I had to get my ear out of there. He was in there screaming. Ah. So what we accomplished tonight? Well, we weren't created for us. We were created for his image. That got lost through sin. Jesus came and was made to be sin to get sin off of us so we could get back to truth. It's the whole reason for the cross, people. The cross isn't just so you go to heaven when you die. That can be totally self-centered. The cross is to restore the truth of why we're here and get the person of Holy Spirit back on the inside of us so that Christ in us can really be the hope of glory. Paul said, you're going to have a baby any day. Paul said, who's had, who's had a child here? What woman has had a child? Raise your hand if you have a child. Okay, watch this. Here's all what Paul knew to compare it to, and I don't know how he knew to compare it. He said, I labor over you as a woman in childbirth. My labor for you, the only thing I can share with what I'm experiencing and feeling on the inside is what I see when a woman has a baby. That's intense, right? And women go, Yes. He said, the only thing I know to compare this thing to is a woman having a baby, that I am the same way until Christ be formed in you. What was his goal? To get a decision? To pray a prayer to go to heaven? To get Christ formed in them. Where they walk in a manner worthy of him. Where they walk in the light as he's in the light. I could show you scripture where they purify themselves even as he is pure. You can't even preach the Bible in churches. They'll call you a blasphemer for preaching scripture because we're so tricked into our human experience that we let our human experience become Lord and deny the grace that changes us. Not my sermon. It's in 1 John 3 purifies themselves even as he is pure. What about Ephesians 5, 1? Walk in love just as he loved. What about 1 John 2? Any man says he abides in him ought to walk even as he walked. Well, that's impossible, brother. Well, then you're saying the word of God is impossible. What you're doing is in your own strength denying the grace of God that changes us so we've weighed ourselves by ourselves and we've come up with a resume and it's all a lie. The Spirit of God can live in me, transform me, and empower me to be what I could never be on my own. It's called new life through Jesus Christ. Yeah? He said, if you believe the things I do, 
you'll do and greater things because I'm going to my Father. And if you believe in me, as the scriptures say, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. This he spake of the Spirit, who had not yet been given because he had not yet been glorified. Is he talking about salvation? He's talking about living your life in Christ. Because four, three chapters before, he's talking about a well springing up into everlasting life. That's born again. Three chapters later, a river coming out of your belly is different than a well springing up. Yeah. John 4, if you'd ask me, I'd give you a drink, one drink, and you'll never thirst again. What is Jesus? The way, not a way, not a good idea, the way, the truth, and the life. What's he? The way back to the Father. We make him the way to heaven. He said, I'm the way back to the Father. Nobody comes to the Father. See, we're trying to get people to sign up a book, a registry to go to heaven when they die. And leave them impersonal and maybe never even get to know God or grow up in God. Just if you die tonight and don't know where you're going, pray this prayer. Jesus did not preach that. Jesus preached if you're going to come after me and follow me, deny yourself. Biggest problem on the planet. You living for you when you're made for my image. Deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. And the things I do, you'll do if you keep your believer intact. Come on, it's all scripture. Oh, I'm preaching the scripture. He says, if you're burdened, you're heavy laden, come unto me, I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Why? Because it's a heavy price to live for yourself. Because you're self-conscious, everything matters, everybody else is your excuse. Now you can be angry and don't even have to take accountability because if they wouldn't have did it, I wouldn't feel this way. Well, you ought to be glad God isn't like that. See, that's the wisdom of men, not the wisdom of God. And we were all trained by it and homeschooled in the wrong home. It's called darkness. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's why we have these services. That's why I'm speaking and crying out like a madman. Why? To get us out of darkness into the light. Yeah? It's called living born again. We were all born into Adam. You must be born again. We turn it into a prayer to go to heaven instead of heaven coming into us. Yeah? You read in your Bible, Jesus was beat so bad. When he went up on that cross, he was so battered. Isaiah said it right. Marred, marred more than any of the sons of men. That means the most sadistic, barbaric thing that a man has ever done to a man. Jesus came out looking worse. Pretty intense. They burned people a lot in those days. Culture burned them on poles. They would soak Christians in oil and light their toes on fire. And watch these Christian, they called them Christian candlesticks. That's what history says. When they persecuted Christians, they called them Christian candlesticks. They would soak Christians in an oil, lamp burning oil, and light their toes. And sit back and laugh and watch their whole body turn into flame. Lydia, when that fire goes out and it's done burning, do you think you could tell if they were male or female, let alone your neighbor or Sally down the street? Jesus was marred more than any of the sons of men. What's that tell you? When he was on that cross, there is no way you could tell it was him. His visage was marred beyond description and there was no way you could tell it was Jesus of Nazareth. Why? Why couldn't he just take 39 stripes and a few stakes? And pay the price. Why did he have to get beat beyond recognition? Because when sin got done with Adam in the garden, he didn't look anything like he was created to be. He completely lost his appearance. And Jesus lost his image and his appearance to get the image of God back on men. And we've turned it into a prayer that blesses me instead of transforms me. And people go to church service after church service and listen to messages that serve them and never even challenge to transform them. And there's beneficial after beneficial after beneficial messages being preached just to keep people in the room so they can keep the thing rolling. I'm not here for what he can do for me. I'm here for how he can make me more like him.
And Paul said, I have enough sometimes and I don't have enough. But none of that moves me and changes a thing because I know why I'm here. You get it? Marred more than any. Now you think how serious Jesus must be when he's paying a price to redeem this truth. You think about this. He's going to let him beat him and beat him. He's totally innocent, Ethan. He's never done anything remotely wrong, even close to wrong. Totally squeaky, clean, pure, and innocent. He's going to let him treat him like he's scum of the earth and devour his image and bust up his body to where he's hanging on the cross. They're going to ridicule and mock him, and the whole time he's doing it to get the lie off of him so that if they call on him, they could be saved. Come on! You see why it was him carrying the cross? Of course he had to because he's the holy lamb, sin free. We all have been touched by sin. But the mentality we grew up with, you don't even make it close to that far. His first day of preaching, reading your Bible, the first day he preached, they were like, whoa. And they're like, whoa. And then they start saying, is he talking about us? Wait, is he talking about us? They were like, this authority, no Pharisees, preachers don't preach like this man. Who is this man? And next thing you know, they're like, hey, is he talking about us? I think he is. Kill him. They tried to kill him. Now you tell me you're encouraged. If you preach and they try to kill you, you're going to jump right back in the saddle and ride. I don't think so. You're going to text your mom and she says, how'd it go, honey? Well, I think I sowed something, but they did try to kill me. That was day in and day out, bickering, backbiting, lying, deceit, all this stuff coming at him, and you never see him change. Come on. If you're doing good and somebody called your good evil, you freak out. Me and you in our life, if you meant well and your friend said, you know why you did that, you just did that because you always said, I didn't think that, I didn't even try. Now you bawl and cry and justify on yourself. I can't even believe you think I would have thought that. Oh, you know, you always do that. You make me so mad. You act all innocent and, and like you had meant good. You know why you did it. You just like to get the attention. Am I being right? When somebody calls your good evil and it was really meant to be good, you freaked out twofold to justify your motive. Jesus was in that every day. Yeah? Every day. My ear's back on the mat. (sighs) No, no, it's all right. It's all right. I'm enjoying it. It's getting training. Try to get a slippery ear in my ear. You think with me on this. If this is, we're not even going to make it to the cross. Do you want to understand what I'm saying? You quit. You gave up on people. Whoever saw Jesus in the morning at the Mount of Olives at daylight, and he's just sitting there bummed out. And Peter's like trying to encourage him. Lord, what's the matter? Don't lord me and don't try to preach to me, Peter. You, I got enough must of you. Well, yeah, but I never saw you this way. Yeah, but you aren't in my shoes. You don't know what I have to deal with every day. Like, I'm I'm teaching people. I hear their thoughts. They're always contesting. I heal them. They tell them, they say I'm the devil. I feed them food. They don't care what I have to say. They just want more food. These people are so self-centered, and I've had enough, and they throng me every day, needy, 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 and could care less about truth. And I've just had enough, and I don't think I need to. Lord, I'm concerned. Don't you preach to me, Peter. See, we think he can't do that because he's Jesus. He can't do that because he's love. Whoever saw Jesus carrying a cross and he can't get Barabbas out of his head because that's the straw that's breaking the Savior's back and he finally just drops the cross and he's not quite there yet. I can't do it, Lord. Barabbas thing's driving me bananas. Are you kidding me? He killed a man. I raised the dead. He's causing conspiracy and I'm trying to bring peace and they want to kill Me and let him go? I mean, I've had enough. It was already enough all these years, but that's too much. I'm supposed to just be okay with this? Look, if these people didn't change by now, they're not going to change. How many more do I have to heal? How many more things do I have to say? I said it all, and they're still the same. Barabbas, are you kidding me? And if he talked like that, in the natural, we'd all understand. In a court of law, in 
in a TV show, he's a victim and we're all villains. But in the kingdom, he can't talk like that because he loves not his own life unto death. And he's here to redeem the lost. So love doesn't have that language. He didn't not say that because he's Jesus. That would make him unattainable and you couldn't follow him. The fact that he said, follow me, means we're following love, not a person. Because if he came as God and we're trying to follow God, we're in a wild goose chase. But if he came as love and revealed the Father, he's saying you can follow. So you've got to understand the roles of Jesus. Suffering Savior, a sin substitute, the wrath of God came upon him and he drank the cup so we could go free. You all get that? But he also modeled the Father. And when you see me, you've already seen him. The fact that he said, follow me in the things I do, you'll do, means he's modeling the life we're created for. So he modeled the life we're created for. He revealed the Father and he paid the price for our sin to get us back to the Father. Why? So we could live the life we were created for. Called Christian. You know what Christian is? First called Christian in Antioch. Why? They were just like him. Those people remind me of that man they crucified. And at that place, they called him Christians. Look it up. Little Christ-like ones. I think we've been so seduced and put to sleep, we think Christian means church attender. Christian means little Christ-like one. That's why he forgives us of all our sin. That's why he remembers our lawless deeds no more. That's why he takes what is red as scarlet and makes it white as snow. Why? Because he pulled us out of darkness into the marvelous light. Yeah? So we have a present and things to come. We don't even have a yesterday. He swallowed it up through his blood. So now I have new life through Jesus Christ, not conformed to the world, transformed because my mind's renewed and I'm thinking like I've never thought before. You get it? All I'm telling you is what a Christian is. It's nothing new. It's been in that book since it's been written. We have made it a whole lot of other things. We have made it all about our blessing, our breakthrough, our provision, our protection. People go to church and deep in their heart, they're disappointed with God. We sing that song, You Never Failed Me Yet, and people have a list of where they think he did because he didn't answer things they prayed. And all of a sudden, we reduce him to a servant instead of a father, a busboy, a table waiter, a genie in a bottle, a wish meter, instead of the one that made us for his image. He is not here to serve me. He's here to love me and put his spirit inside of me so I can follow him. Would you join me? Would you say that in your heart tonight and say, you know what? I'm convicted by this. I'm going to start praying into this in my life and ask Holy Spirit to empower me to live this way. And if ever the metal would crunch, God forbid, I'll be ready to minister Jesus. If ever I'm betrayed and done wrong, I won't just wake up betrayed and done wrong. I will wake up and shine, cover a multitude of sin with love and let mercy triumph over judgment. I don't know about you, but when I look at him, I see freedom. And I believe him inside of us should translate into freedom. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Free from what? Just sin? The root of all sin. Me living for me. There was never a sin committed on the earth that wasn't hinged to a self-centered motive. So if you die to yourself, what are you saying? You're perfect? I'm saying I'm pure in my heart. I'm dying to myself. And he's going to help me grow up into him in all things. I'm not proclaiming perfect. I'm proclaiming change, transformed, and making no excuse for weakness. I didn't find a way to sin and get away with it. I found a way to be free. And that's going to produce something in me that looks like better than it's ever looked before. And you can't even talk about it in the church because everybody blows heresy flags because we let our experience dictate truth instead of his word and grace. So what's it look like, Ethan, if a man's completely surrendered? 
What does that man look like if he totally puts on righteousness, is accepted in the beloved and doesn't need this way because he's fulfilled this way and now he loves this way? What does that man even look like? And can that man even talk about it without being judged? Because who do you think you are? Yeah? Wow, wow, wow. This is why we're Christians, people. I'm going to pray something over you, and then what time is it, man? You ain't got no clock nowhere around here? That's dangerous, especially with me. No, that's scary dangerous. I have to get my phone and look at my... What is it? Okay. Well, you started at 6, see? See, I got ruined a long time ago. They used to do it at 6 o'clock, and I thought... It's funny, but it's real. I thought they made it 6 to give me more time. I thought, well, I flew in. They're giving me all these sessions. They made it six. Give it extra out. I won't seem as long. And then this pastor got up and said, now remember, tomorrow we meet at six. Since we're coming back in Sunday, we don't want it to get quite as late. And we thought if we start early, we won't get out as late. And I went, is that why they do it? Because if that's why they've done it, it's never worked. Ever. Like never. In fact, sometimes we start at six. I get on a roll and we leave later than if we just started at seven. And I'm like, this has never worked. And now my conscience is all violated because now I know why they do it. (sighs) So I can't get away with it now. So I got up and I asked him, is that why? He said, well, yeah. I went, oh, I'm ruined. I'm ruined. I I got robbed an hour so many Saturdays since then. No, no, no. We're going going to pray for everybody real quick here. Listen, you can't just hear a message like this and leave. When I say listen, I'm not being controlling. Just open your heart and listen. You can't just leave, hear a message like this and leave and say, okay, I'm going to go do that. You become it. And the way you become it is first wanting to. And you want to understand in your heart that this is why I'm on the earth. This is what he paid for. And this is what he empowers And when nobody's looking, just you in your secret place, he'll see you in the secret and reward you in the open. What do you do? You get alone. Lord, I realize you made me for your image. Oh my goodness, you love me. When I was living unlovable, all you saw was what you created me for. And you're willing to wash away everything I've ever been to empower me to be everything you've intended. You've made all things new. It's as if I've never lived another life. I've got new life through Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, you're talking to the Lord about that. Nobody owes me a thing. The emotions that I live with are perverse. No longer will stress and strife and frustration and anger and unforgiveness have any place in my life. Man, I'm on the earth to shine. I'm on the earth to love. And I've said this a million times when you weren't looking. And nobody owes me a thing. i said that a million times in the Lord. Nobody owes me a thing. See, because if you owe me, you could let me down. If you owe me, you might not pay up. And if you don't pay up, then you become my reason for wherever it is I am. And that would be idolatry because I'm letting something matter more than what matters most. And all of a sudden, I'm letting what one person said trump what one person said. I'm letting what one person did trump what one person did. That's a sign of self-centered deception. It's never going to happen in my life again, I'm telling you. 28 years in, I'm being bold. That's never going to happen. I see it. Who the sun sets free, free indeed. Don't you think in 28 years I haven't been tested in this? I preach it constantly. (laughs) If you were the devil, and I'm glad you're not, but if you were the devil, you would be trying to prove on any every angle that what I'm saying isn't true, and you'd try to break the person that's saying it, wouldn't you? Don't you think I haven't been through a whole bunch of stuff? You just can't see it because none of those things make me who I am. In fact, I don't need Shadrach's story anymore. I've been in enough fire. He's the Lord. And the fourth man is always in there. So I don't need to read Shadrach's story. I got my own. So if you see passion in somebody, it's probably because of the fire. (laughs) And they don't have a confession, Jesus is Lord. Their heart knows Jesus is Lord. (laughs) And they don't just have to believe and say, He loves me hoping it's true. Oh, he loves me with his life. And his love has never failed. Yeah? 
That's where passion comes from, I promise. Living in the moment with him. Amen? Amen. So you get alone in prayer. I could take the time, but not tonight. Maybe tomorrow we'll follow up. Let me ask you a question. This is a crazy question. Who, who thinks they'll be... What do you have, morning service? Who actually thinks they'll be in the morning service tomorrow? Can I see who says they would be here? I'm not like heavy gauge in hand, so I just wanted to see if it's a majority. Okay. Because I might, I, might, I might tack on to where we're at and just jump right in there. We'll see. But Colossians 3, if I don't, Colossians 3 is an amazing tool. In your own time, open Colossians 3. It says your life... You're, you're, you're risen with Christ, so your life's hidden in him. Seek the things which are above, not the things of the earth, for your life is hidden in him. And when he who is your life appears, you'll appear with him in glory. It's powerful. And then it talks about, therefore, putting to death the things of your flesh and the things on the earth. He doesn't say balance it, manage it, and find a healthy level. He says kill it. Put it to death. Your members, which are on the earth, put it to death. And then he does anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Put it to death. Put it off. And then he says, don't lie to one another because you've put off the old man and his deeds. I grew up in church. I probably went to four churches till I was 18. Mom trying to keep me interested. And I don't think anybody ever told me that I could put off the old man. I think they all told me I was always going to be that man and I ought to be thankful God forgives me. My Bible says put it off. Put off the old man and his deeds and put on the new man. <whistles> Colossians chapter 3. Somebody have a Bible handy? Colossians chapter 3. Chapter 3 verse 12. So we're going to put off the old man. And put on the new. Who's got verse 12? What's verse 12 say? Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Would you stand up and read that out loud? Real loud? Just read verse 12 to the bond of perfection. Just read that what's coming up. Watch. We're going to put off the old man and his deeds. That's all the works of the flesh that are listed in Colossians 3. We're going to put that off. How do you do that without getting in the works and running the risk of failing? By doing it in prayer and being sincere and saying, man, I realize I was never made for these things. I've lived every one of them, but they were never intended to be me. I'm dying to this, and I'm putting on who you created me to be. Can you read who that is? Since God chose you to be holy people, he loves. You must clothe yourselves with tender tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Yeah, keep going. Okay. And above all, remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Next verse. Okay. Uh, and above all, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. There you go. It's so powerful. So when he says old man and new man, the old man is our nature apart from him. The new man is his nature in us. So his whole nature is love, forgiveness, mercy, tender mercies, loving kindness, forgiveness, and above all these things, love, which is the bond of perfection. So I'm going to make this bold statement in closing. If we fail, we can go to church for the rest of our lives and never miss a Sunday. But if we fail to become love, we never step into what he actually paid for when he died on the cross. Because right. the image was lost through sin. And God is love. God's the spirit. He's not a head and arms and legs. If God made us after his image and he's a head and arms and legs, we all look like him. We all look different. Look around. Look around. Stand up again for me and spin. <laughs> Are you ever going to mistake us? Are you going to mix us up? If I come to your church for a month, are you going to call me him and him me and say, I always get you two mixed up? <laughs> no, you're not because we don't look anything alike. But we can both look just like him. Yeah. And that's what makes us one. And that's called the unity of faith. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. yeah. So he made us after his image, not his appearance. God is love. 
1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of our instruction is love through a pure heart, clear conscience, and unfeigned childlike faith. The goal of our instruction, the purpose of the commandment is love. He says, let us love one another, right? For love is of God. Everyone who loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Watch, he who loveth not just doesn't know God like he could. Doesn't say you don't go to church. Doesn't say you don't pastor. Doesn't say you don't go on a mission trip. But he said, if you don't love, there's one reason, not one of two. You don't know him like you could. And this is eternal life, that you might know him. Come on, all I'm preaching is scripture. It's 1 John 4, 7 and 8. If you don't love, that's unconditional. That's taking no account of the suffer wrong, keeping no records of wrong, and not seeking your own. If you don't love, there's one reason you don't know him like you could, and you couldn't know him and not be affected by him. That's an invite. So you got to take that to prayer. And if you're having trouble with unforgiveness, if you're having trouble with emotions and feelings and hurt and pain and frustration towards others, it's time to get alone in a room and say, you know what, I don't believe you made me this way. And I believe you want to transform me and I'm willing to be transformed. I'm done taking account of suffer wrongs. I'm done living on my own standards and rules. Nobody owes me a thing. As of tonight, I lay it before you. My life is not my own. He read it when he read 2 Corinthians. If we live because he died, then we ought to not live for ourselves, but him who died. He read it. (laughs) Y'all good? So let me pray something over you. You take this to prayer because you can't leave here and say, oh boy, I don't know what to think of that. You can't just say, okay, I got to try harder. You don't do this, you become this. You don't do it, you become it. So when you get squeezed, the orange juice comes out. If the car hits my car and I'm trying to apply the last sermon I preached, I'm late. I can't be under my airbag going, okay, okay, I'm supposed to shine, not supposed to take things personal. I need to be an example. Somebody might really need to see Christ out there. Okay, hey guys. That would be weird. (laughs) When the metal crunches, I should have already been with him. Why? Because of Matthew 7, the wise man hears and becomes. And when the storm comes and beats vehemently against the house, it stands because it was built on the rock. What's the storm trying to destroy? The occupant of the house or everything God's building? And yet we take adversity personal and give ourselves away. He ain't trying to stop you. He could care less about you. He's only threatened when you start growing in the kingdom. He wants to stop the kingdom. And the kingdom of God is in you. Are you with me? Come on, that's just solid preaching right there. I have to tell you that's solid preaching. So Father, let your grace come in this house. Let your wisdom reign here. And what a meeting house. What a blessing. See, this isn't the church, guys. This is a meeting house. This is a place to meet. It's not a play on words. You're the church. But what a blessing to have a meeting house, facility, and everything we need to help empower what we're doing. So God, we ask you to continue to bless this place. Let wisdom rule here. But most of all, let this be a place where love lives and abounds. God, if we don't walk in love, we miss the whole point of why you came. Would you empower us to grow up into you in this truth? In Jesus' name. Amen?